Good evening, everyone. And in just a few seconds, we will start this presentation. I will make the introductions now. Welcome to our FSHP Solutions to the Opioid Epidemic, a call to action, one hour CE webinar for pharmacists and pharmacy technicians. I am pleased to introduce Michelle Krishbaum, and the presentation will primarily be Michelle. And thank you, Michelle, for giving us a wave there. I'm Kathy Baldwin. I am the current president of the Florida Society of Health System Pharmacists. Michelle, if you'll scooch to the next side, slide for me. These are our objectives. You probably are familiar with them. We have about 58 slides, so we're going to move rather quickly. Michelle? As far as disclosures go, Michelle is the clinical manager at Baptist Health South Florida and has nothing to disclose. And I am the current president of FSHP. Thank you, Michelle. And with that, it is 6 p.m. And go ahead, Michelle. All right. Thanks, Kathy, so much. So welcome, everybody. This is Managing Opioid Use Disorder. So um, I am now a clinical manager at Baptist Health South Florida. Um, but previous, um, as of about a month ago, I was at Broward Health Medical Center, and I oversaw the medication-assisted treatment program there. So um, just both the you know pharmaceutical side of it and the social work, you know, um, non-farm side of helping patients who had primarily opioid or stimulant use disorder here in South Florida. So um, that's where a lot of this information is going to come from, what I kind of saw in my clinic, um, and then kind of the research behind it. So here's some of the objectives. I'm going to skip most of these two because, you know, they're kind of the same as, as you've already seen. So let's just briefly go over the federal regulations. So as of January 12, 2023, the X waiver for buprenorphine um, is no longer needed. So I know that was kind of a big shock to us um, as pharmacists, and we were all like, wait, what do we do now, right? So buprenorphine um, for pain, if you see at the bottom here, so that was a Schedule Three narcotic and no waiver was ever needed. Oh, let me go back. So let's see if I have my little laser pointer here. Here we go. So for pain, so they're doing a buprenorphine, a butrans patch, we never needed the X waiver. But if you were doing it for opioid use disorder, you used to need to have an X waiver. And then this is a reminder, methadone for opioid use disorder, um, we could not do. Um, so you couldn't dispense it in an outpatient, you could only do it in the hospital for, um, you couldn't start them on it, but you could continue them on it if they were already getting it from a methadone clinic. So what this means now is that anybody that has a DEA license, so physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, they can now do buprenorphine for opioid use disorder or for pain, and there's there's no um, there's no additional prescribing that's needed. There is going to be some future education that's coming down that is going to be required, but um, that's coming later in fall from SAMHSA. Okay, so what's the evidence for medication assisted treatment? Why are, why are you even bothering to give people buprenorphine? Why don't we just give them, you know, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy and be done with it. So there's an 80 to 90% relapse rate without medication assisted treatment. And when I'm saying medication assisted treatment, I'm primarily talking about methadone or buprenorphine. Long acting naltrexone is, is considered MAT, but that's not where this evidence lies. There's a 70% reduction in the death rate. So they did a 2015 study found that twice as many patients were in opioid use disorder treatment at 30 days, 80% of them, with um, when they had initiated buprenorphine in an emergency department, and they also had a brief negotiated interview um, compared with a referral only or a brief negotiated interview plus a facilitated referral. And those patients that were um, that started on buprenorphine in the ED and had the negotiated interview um, used less illicit opioids in the last seven days. Okay, so this a lot of this evidence started was well why would we start people on buprenorphine in the ED when they come in? Why don't we just give them a referral? Well, this is why, because you have twice as many of them who are staying in treatment once you start them on buprenorphine in your ED. There was a 2003 study that said patients maintain on buprenorphine of 16 milligrams a day versus a control group that received buprenorphine just for detox, um, followed by placido. Um, their treatment failure rate for placebo was 100%. So just we gave them for six days and then we got off of it versus 25% for buprenorphine. And the reason that I have that in there is that a lot of these patients, um, there's what we call FAR certified clinics or FAR certified housing here in Florida. So they need to be certified through the Florida um, you know, Recovery Board. Most of those places want people to detox from buprenorphine immediately. 
well, 25% versus 100% of, um, of maintaining that, right, of maintaining their, you know, their sobriety. So when we keep people on at least 16 milligrams, which is our target dose, versus just putting them on it for a few days and getting them off, um, is a much, it's a much better benefit, right? So even more, you're, you're not convinced yet, Michelle. All right, well, let me try to convince you some more. So there was a 2014 meta-analysis and it determined that patients on buprenorphine of at least 16 milligrams a day or greater were almost twice as likely, more likely to stay in treatment than placebo-treated patients. And buprenorphine decreased the number of opioid positive drug tests by 14.2%, okay? Now, medication assisted treatment should always be paired with cognitive behavioral therapy and counseling, right? We don't let patients go this alone, right? It's kind of like depression. We can give people sertraline or Prozac or, you know, whatever, but usually we need people to be in therapy too. We need to have that, that combo um, treatment, you know, when we're doing this. So let's start off with a patient case. This is PR. Comes into your ED and says, I need something to help me quit fentanyl. 36-year-old male um, presenting with body aches. Onset was a day ago and it's starting to get more gradual. It's starting to increase. Um, the course and the duration of symptoms is fluctuating in intensity. So it's kind of generalized pain. Um, the symptom is just, just saying pain, dull and achy, degrees moderate. Um, when he moves, it makes it worse. When he's resting, he feels a little bit better. Risk factors, drug abuse, prior episodes. He's had two in the last year where he's come in. He's not on any therapy. He's having back pain. He's denying chest pain, denying abdominal pain, denying nausea, denying vomiting, and denying shortness of breath. Hey, I'm homeless. I, I, do, IV, I do IV fentanyl. And the last time I used it was last night. It was around 10 p.m. So just in this case, it's about 15 hours ago. Okay, so that's PR. We're going to come back to him. So let's talk a little bit about fentanyl because fentanyl is the driver of the opioid crisis right now. It is not prescription pain meds. Um, and I have some, some slides on that. I think a little bit later I can talk more about it. So what is fentanyl? So it's a synthetic short acting, it's very lipophilic. It's an opioid analgesic. It's 50 to hundred times more potent than morphine, right? Um, and it's 33 times more potent than heroin. Now what we're having is we're having this illicitly manufactured fentanyl in these analogs, right? So you have Sioux fentanyl and you have car fentanyl. So car fentanyl, just so you know, if your patients are talking about it, a lot of times they're gonna say that it's, it's the purple fentanyl, right? So just car fentanyl when they're out on the street, it happens to be purple. So car fentanyl is a hundred times more potent than fentanyl, which is a hundred times more potent than morphine. So we have a crisis, right? Cause we can kill people. You know, this is like a great picture here. Like here's heroin, here's fentanyl and these are equivalent doses and here's car fentanyl, right? Just a, just a little, you know, piece of it will definitely um, kill people, you know, who aren't tolerant. So most cases of fentanyl related morbidity and mortality have been linked to illicitly manufactured fentanyl. So this is not people who are, you know, doing fentanyl patches, you know, stealing it from the grandma for cancer and, you know, doing it. This is illicitly manufactured fentanyl that's coming in, right? It's not prescription fentanyl. And we know that from looking at the prescribing rates of fentanyl in this country and the distribution of it is not matching, you know, the overdose rates, right? So this is not prescription fentanyl. This is illicitly manufactured. Half-life is really short. It's two to four hours. However, and this is where we're going to kind of change the, the, the narrative of how we used to treat opioid use disorder. Fentanyl's, because of fentanyl's lipophilicity, when patients keep reusing this exposure to it, right, they keep, they're, they're shooting up, they're doing it over days, weeks, whatever, it prolongs the clearance of it. And so this is increasing the incidence of precipitated withdrawal when we start initiating buprenorphine at 12 to 18 hours, um, even if the patient has a mild to moderate cow score. So normally, even, you know, a year ago, two years ago, when somebody came into my ED, in, and they said, you know, fentanyl or, you know, whatever, especially as we're having these illicitly manufactured fentanyl, car fentanyl has a longer half-life than fentanyl does. I could give somebody eight milligrams of, fent of buprenorphine 12 to 18 hours later, right? The half-life's two to four hours, no big deal, right? And, and I would be fine. And when I'm doing that now, I'm finding that we kept pushing people into the precipitated withdrawals and then we're losing them in the process, right? Like losing them, their buy-in into the program, right? They want to go out and they want to reuse because they're miserable. So here's an opioid withdrawal timeline, right? So this is kind of a great one. So when we talk about opioid use and we're thinking about short acting, fentanyl is considered a short acting opioid, right? Two to four hours. So your heroin, your morphine, your oxycodone, Onset of withdrawal is typically six to 12. We have the symptom peak at 36 to 72. Duration of withdrawal is at five days, right? Now that doesn't mean that they won't still have cravings and things after that, but kind of the, the symptoms of all of that, you know, the depression, the cramps, the vomiting, all of that, you know, about five days and we're done. Something more long acting like methadone, you know, is, is gonna 
have a lot longer of an onset, right? So you know it's going to be 36 to 48 hours before that withdrawal starts to come on. Symptom peak is closer to 72 hours, and the duration can be up to three weeks. So when we have acute opioid withdrawal, what are patients going to look like when they come into your ED, or maybe you're seeing them, um, you know, in a you know ambulatory care clinic, or you know whatever, whatever the case is, wherever you're running into them. So they can have tachycardia, hypertension, hyperthermia, sweating, the hot flashes, but then also chills. They're going to feel kind of feverish, you know, uh, insomnia and yawning. So patients, that's kind of the, the telltale sign. They will yawn. They won't even say that they're tired, but right in the middle of talking to you, they'll just let out these big yawns. And that's why I have the baby here because this is, you know, very cute. Um, so muscle spasms, aches, tremor, you know, cramping, you know, they don't really feel good. So what are the kind of laboratory tests that we're going to want to do um, when we have somebody on here? So we're going to, if they're having significant vomit, vomiting and diarrhea, let's go get, you know, your serum electrolytes just to make sure, you know, they're not, you know, super hyponatremic or, you know, whatever. And we have to, you know, correct something. If they're female, you know, we wanted to get a pregnancy test. And then we want to do a liver function test if we're initiating buprenorphine. So one other thing that I want to talk about right now is xylazine. So xylazine is an alpha-2 agonist, right? So we're thinking like, you know, clonidine or whatever. It's, a, it's the same mechanism. On the street, it's called trank, um, trank dope, anesthesia de caballo. I know my Spanish is terrible. Please forgive me. Um, so xylazine um, is an FDA-approved medication for veterinary use. Um, and what, what started happening is, um, especially uh, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania in general probably have the highest rates of this right now, in order to lengthen the euphoric effect of fentanyl, they started cutting fentanyl with xylazine. And so this actually, um, the xylazine misuse actually started in Puerto Rico and has kind of kind of made its way around here. This is happening in Florida. It's not happening to the same, the cutting is not happening at the same level as like Pennsylvania, where it's something like one in every three doses of fentanyl has xylazine in it, but it is happening here. So it's a short-term sedative. It's an analgesic, can be a muscle relaxant. Um, it's worked on, you know, we said veterinarians using it. So the thing is, is that think about an alpha-2 agonist. So where it's lowering heart rate and blood pressure, and then it's also helping lower the breathing rate, the slowing the breathing rate, which we know fentanyl and the opioids are doing, right? That's its mechanism there. And what I have in there is you get this skin ulcers and necrosis when people are injecting it. And so if you're having patients come in and they're having these sores that are looking nasty, they're not healing, there's a good chance that we're um, it's being caught with xylazine. And remember, we can reverse fentanyl with Narcan or naloxone, we cannot reverse xylazine. Xylazine is not going to respond to that because naloxone only works on the opioid receptors. It's not working on, on the alpha receptors. So just when you're seeing those other things, that's, you know, kind of like, oh, they have these sores that are not, you know, healing. It's, you know, could be that the xylazine is being caught. Okay, so we, we know a little bit about the background. How are we going to treat these patients? So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to assess them using the COWS, the Clinical Opioid Withdrawal Scale. Now, CALS is not a perfect assessment. There's subjective and objective symptoms, right? I have a pulse rate. That's nice and objective. Great. I can, I can get a number. Um, but then it's restlessness, right? You know, pupil size. It's really hard to determine pupil size when they're sitting in your ED and these bright lights are coming over and it's like, you know, are their pupils dilated? Well, you know, who's going to be dilated when these lights are there, you know? So um, it can be a little bit you know, subjective, but, you know, you kind of do the best that you can. And, and it may be possible that you, when you score versus a nursing scoring that, you know, the scoring may be, you know, a couple points off, you know, that's okay. So the score here, mild is five to 12, moderate 13 to 24, moderately severe 25 to 36 and severe is 36. And the reason that we want to know this is because we have typically used this to go, when can I initiate buprenorphine in a patient, right? So, um, so we'll, we'll come back to that, the cow score. So now I wanted to also talk about urine drug screen examples, because this is not something that I learned until I did my PGY2. Um, we didn't really learn it in school and you see these values and you have no idea. And so this is a, this is kind of a standard urine tox screen, right? This is, um, you know, from my old hospital. Um, so it's going to have benzos and it, and then I have in here the analyte, what is it looking for? So the thing is, is that with opiates, it's looking for morphine. And I talk about it um, on the next slide, what it's, what it's going to find. Um, and then how long kind of detection times here, right? So even for benzos, Xanax um, and, you know, your clonopins here, this is, you may not cross react with this because they don't turn into oxazepam the way that diazepam does. Diazepam metabolizes down to oxazepam and that's what it's looking for. 
You can have some cross reactivity with alprazolam and clonazepam, but you may not have it, right? And this is where it's going to be important because when we're looking at, at morphine, if you're doing a standard urine drug screen and not an opiate specific drug screen, your patients on tramadol, fentanyl, or methadone are not going to test positive. And I don't want you to think like, oh, well, they didn't. They, they're not on fentanyl. Well, you have, to, you have to know what you're looking for and what is the test looking for, right? So on a standard urine drug screen, it'll find morphine and codeine. Yes, it's going to find heroin because heroin metabolizes to morphine. It may find hydrocodone, oxycodone. Those are semi-synthetics because there's some cross-reactivity. It's very unlikely to find buprenorphine and it is not going to find these fully synthetic um, opioids, right? So if patients are on those and you're doing a standard urine drug screen and it comes back negative, you are not necessarily out of the clear because you're not, you weren't looking, you didn't do the right test to look for, you know, what you wanted to find. And I'm going to tell you right now, everybody's on fentanyl, that when people come in that in their, their overdosing, whatever, it's because of fentanyl, it is being cut into everything. There are press tablets that look like, um, Xanax two milligram bars. They have fentanyl in them. There's um, the cocaine is all being cut. If anybody remembers last year, um, the um, gentleman from West Point who came down, we're celebrating spring break and, um, you know, they overdosed, two of them passed away. They were doing cocaine that had fentanyl in it. They thought they were doing cocaine, right? So it's, it's in there and it's, and it's kind of deadly, which is why we have this conversation, why, we're, why you're here today. So, so let's go back to PR. So let's do his cows right now. So we've, we've done a cows assessment. So his, let's say his resting pulse rate was between 81 to 100. We'll say it was 90, right? So he gets one point for that. We have bone um, or joint angst. He got a four, um, anxiety or irritability. He's saying so irritable. He's having a hard time, you know, telling you what his problem was. So he gets a four for that. Restlessness is a one, pupil size is a one. So it was possibly larger than normal for room light, but we were in the ED, it was hard to see. So uh, we go ahead, we ask the doc, hey, can you order the urine drug screen with, with opioids? And he's at an, a score of 11 right now. We add all these up, four, eight, nine, 10, 11. We get an 11 of mild, right? So we're looking at it. So he's in mild withdrawal. Okay, so what are we going, you know, what, what do we do next with him? So the, our thought is going to be, you know, we can't start methadone, right? We're not a methadone clinic. Um, you know, and, and long-acting naltrexone is going to make this guy honestly worse. So our, our choice here really is buprenorphine. And I love buprenorphine. I love the product and I love how it helps patients. And I've seen that, you know, over the last year of running a, a MAC clinic, right? So let's dig into it. So buprenorphine is a partial mu opioid agonist, right? So it doesn't give that full high that, you know, morphine, fentanyl, oxycodone give, it gives a partial, right? But it has a really long half-life and a, in a really high affinity for the mu opioid receptor. So it displaces, it kicks off those other opioids. And I have KI values um, on the next slide. So after the sublingual in, um, administration, so when they place it under the tongue, it's half-life is 28 to 37 hours, which is awesome, right? It's going to stick around for a long time and hang out on those receptors. So um, it has very poor bioavailability if it's swallowed. So we're, you know, don't tell people, you know, I've seen this before, like nursing has done this where, you know, they give them, a, we had the tablets, not the film, right? So they give them a tablet and some water and it's like, nope, that now the drug didn't work, right? So the sublingual administration is 30 to 50% of IV, full absorption can take up to 10 minutes. We want to help a lot of our patients smoke. We want to tell them don't smoke for 10 to 15 minutes before taking it to help the tablet dissolve faster. I have the different dosage forms here. The patch uh, transdermal is just for pain, but all these other ones um, can be used for um, opioid use disorder. Um, so here's all the adverse effects, right? Headache, insomnia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Now, could that also be coming from the fact that they're withdrawing off opioids? Absolutely. It might not be the buprenorphine. It just might be the disease state. The sublingual and the bucofilm have some other ones, you know, some glossodynia, some oral hypoesthesia, kind of like some numbing. One thing that was added since probably um, some of you may have been in pharmacy school, it's been added since I was in pharmacy school and learned this, was this extensive tooth decay. So after it's fully dissolved, um, we want to swish a large sip of water and then wait at least one hour before brushing teeth. So what was happening was patients were taking it and then they kind of get that, that feel, you know, that taste off. They were brushing their teeth. Well, it was actually kind of... Um, pushing the drug into the teeth and then kind of, it was, you know, leading to some extensive tooth decay. So we just want to swish around some water. They can brush their teeth later, right? So here's the binding affinities. So this is such a big deal here. So one, I love KI values. It's like my favorite thing to talk about. So there's other stuff I don't know about. You all could probably teach me more, but I do love KI values. 
So remember with KI value, this is the binding affinity only. It does not tell you what, what does the drug do when it gets the receptor. It just says in a, in a, in a race, who's going to win when binding to that. And we want the lower number, remember? So the way that I think about it is if drug A has a binding affinity of one and drug B has a binding affinity of 100, it will take 100 times the amount of drug B to displace drug A off that receptor, right? So we want this low number. And this is why the patient must be in withdrawal from the cow score before we initiate buprenorphine. Because if you have morphine here is a 1.17, Methadone's a 3.38. We have fentanyl of a 1.35. That's what they're doing. Here's buprenorphine, 0 0.2. It's even, it's even lower than naloxone, right? So buprenorphine is going to kick off everybody off that mu opioid receptor. And then it's going to hang around for 28 to 37 hours, right? So morphine doesn't have a chance to come back in. You know, fentanyl doesn't have a chance to come back in because their half-life is two to four hours, right? So the body is going to metabolize it. Same thing when we talk about with naloxone, right? When we're when we're reversing somebody, um, and I think Kathy talks about this a little bit later. When you you know we do the naloxone nasal spray, it's only going to work for thirty to ninety minutes, and then the fentanyl or the morphine or whatever is going to come back and rebind, and they're going to re-overdose, right? Buprenorphine doesn't have that problem. It's going to act like a blanket and kick everybody off for a long time, right? Because it has this low low binding affinity. Now you'll notice sufentanil and carfentanil, it's the same or pretty close, right? So in that case, we need to watch it, but its half-life is so much longer than those drugs as well. So now I want to talk about kinetics and, and dose-related efficacy. So we have data here, this is from Greenwald on um, 2014, that we want to keep patients on at least 16 milligrams of buprenorphine. And so here's what we have here is how much mu opioid receptor are we covering, right? So at two milligrams, a nice little like baby dose to start, we're covering 25 to 45%. So as we move up in eight milligram, we're covering 65 to 85. Once we get into 16 milligrams, we're starting to cover 80 to 90% of those mu opioid receptors. And as we keep going up, we're covering, um, you know, darn near 100% of them. Well, so what, Michelle? Well, let's go back a second, right? So this is KI value. So we've started somebody on buprenorphine, we've started them on therapy, they're doing really well. They have a recurrence of symptoms, which is the ROSC friendly way of saying that they've had a relapse, right? They go out, some things are bad, they use. Well, you've got them on at least 16 milligrams. So you have now put a buprenorphine umbrella over all their mu opioid receptors. So even with carfentanil coming in at the same KI, where's it gonna bind to? There's already a drug there right? There's already buprenorphine just sitting there hanging out for over a day, holding those down and holding them at, you know, so it's preventing overdose in these patients. And so one thing that always drove me nuts is we would have patients come in who we had started on 16 milligrams. They come into the hospital for, you know, whatever the reason is. And these doctors would be like, oh, you relapsed? Well, I'm only going to give you eight this time. Well, that's asinine. What you should be doing is instead of going to you instead of going going down to eight, you should be increasing them to 24 milligrams and increasing their dose. Because let's take something innocuous like diabetes, right? If somebody came in and had in DKA, you would never discharge them and go, oh, well, I'm not going to give you insulin anymore because clearly you can't handle it. And now you need to do it based on diet and exercise. Good luck. You would never do that, but we treat patients with opioid use disorder like that all the time. And this is where I'm getting on my soapbox and I'm getting like really feisty. So hopefully at home, you're just being like, wow, she's really angry. Um, we need to treat these patients like we would treat anybody else. And in that case, you need to increase the dose. And so um, we know that that's where the value is. We know that patients do better. They have less relapses. They, they stay in treatment longer when we have them on at least 16 milligrams. And so opioid withdrawal suppression appears to require at least 50% coverage. But blocking that opioid reinforcement or like that high that patients get, you need to be at at least 80% coverage, um, which is a butte plasma level of equal to or greater than three nanograms per ml. And so for those of you out there, if some of you may have this at your hospitals or maybe you're looking at the, um, the buprenorphine long acting injectable, that's where it's getting is these butte plasma levels of um, greater than or equal to three nanograms. So we need to keep these patients on at least 16 milligrams to keep them safe, to keep them, you know, in, engaged in the program long term while they're going through all of their cognitive behavioral therapy and their, um, you know, their, their regular therapy. So this slide. So Yale School of Medicine used to have this more complicated ED initiated buprenorphine um, th that they had in this. And that was back when there was the X waiver. 
I'm going to tell you right now, this is a modified version and this is Michelle's modified version. This came from me. This came from my experience in the last year dosing patients in RED on fentanyl or who, who were using fentanyl, which is what everybody's coming in on. So if somebody comes in, we're going to give them a cow score. If they're at zero to seven, we're, we're, going to, we're not going to dose them because they're in mild withdrawal in the ED. We're not going to dose them yet because that, that fentanyl is not out of their system, right? It's still in there and hanging out. You, you want to provide a, a prescription. Now, let me, I mean, we're going to come back because this is the same as over here. Let's say that they're in mild to severe withdrawal. It used to be that you could start people on eight, four to eight milligrams of, of buprenorphine, get them to 16 milligrams on day two, and then get them in the program and they were fine, good to go. What I saw in my clinical experience over and over and over again is even patients with a score, we're going to go back to PR, right? He's got a score of 11. Um, patients that said, I haven't used fentanyl in a day. Um, we were giving them eight milligrams and we were throwing them right into precepts or precipitated withdrawals. And these patients were nauseous and, and throwing up and they didn't feel good and they had chills and they were pissed at the doctor, at me, at my peer specialist who were seeing them bedside and trying to get them into treatment. And now all they wanted, they cannot wait to get out of that ED and go use again, right? Because I've made them miserable. And then they'd be like, well, let, just give me another buprenorphine. Well, the problem is I'm just going to make it worse, right? Because any fentanyl that you had hanging around, I'm going to push the rest of it off, right? As I go to 16 milligrams, right? And so I had to explain to patients, like, if I give you more buprenorphine, you're going to feel even worse. So this is kind of Michelle's own dosing strategy that we were doing in our ED, and it seemed to be very successful. And what we started people on was we would give them only two milligrams of sublingual buprenorphine. So we'd start them at a two. And then on day two, we would increase it. Now you can increase pretty fast. We would give them four Q12 hours, right? So four in the morning, four in the afternoon. By day three, we were at eight Q12, right? So we were at our 16 milligram dose. And then if we needed to go up to go up to 24 from there, we, you know, we could, we would do it in our clinic, right? And we want to refer them for ongoing treatment. So that's what I would start people on is just do this kind of baby dose of two milligrams. This is not considered microdosing, but it is, it is two milligrams. Um, and then you give them four Q12, eight Q12. So this is, this is why I say it's modified because if you, if anybody's seen their old one, it looks just like this. Um, so the prescription's the same two milligrams on day one and tell them, hey, when you start to feel really sick or whatever, that's when you start this. And then the same referral for ongoing treatment. Now, if no fentanyl use, you did an opiate screen, it didn't come back, it came back for oxycodone, whatever, or their last use of fentanyl was over 36 hours, then you can consider doing an eight milligram, right? You can consider that higher dose. And then you wanna make sure you're doing a warm handoff if you can to an opioid treatment facility, not just be like, hey, here's the number to South Florida Wellness Network, good luck, or you know, whatever. We wanna to try to say like, hey, we've got an appointment with you over at Bar, I'm using local South Florida places. I'm sorry for anybody who's not from South Florida, just who we would call, hey, we've got an appointment for you at Bark on, you know, tomorrow at noon, you know, what can I do to help you? And with me, I had a whole peer specialist team that helped with a lot of that. And they were really great with kind of making those appointments. So peer specialists are amazing. Um, this is the same thing, the buprenorphine induction that you've just seen on the other page. Withdrawal management, these are just examples that you can use, Tylenol, ibuprofen, cyclobenzaprine, you know. What I have on here too is um, for anxiety and agitation, did it come up? It's not, no, it didn't. I had a little thing that came up and said, do not use benzos here, right? We wanna avoid benzos if possible for anxiety and agitation in these patients um, because they are gonna really want them. <laughs> Um, they will tell you and then it's now you're doing a whole other problem of you're trying to taper them off benzos or whatever we have other drugs try to avoid it if i can now that's not that's not your icu patients who overdose you give them benzos you give them whatever you need to kind of help them step down from icu this is more of like in your ed in and outpatient treatment you know clinic or whatever this is what you want to use for anxiety and agitation you want to avoid benzos if possible um and then same thing with the induction with matt if positive for fentanyl if negative for fentanyl same thing that i've just said like three times so let's go back to PR. So he's in mild withdrawal, right? So we're gonna start two milligrams of, of buprenorphine, naloxone, uh, the combo product um, for, um, we're gonna give him some ibuprofen because he's, remember he said that he's got muscle aches, clonidine, he's saying he's having anxiety. We're gonna give him a prescription now because we don't need an X waiver for four um, twice a day tomorrow and then eight. We're always gonna give him a take home naloxone nasal spray, maybe a few. Um, there's a lot of places that Kathy's gonna talk about how to get these. I and mean, then any other comfort medications the patient may use and can't afford, um, that's always kind of a problem. T 
talked about peer specialists, we want to get a follow-up appointment to um, a clinic that will help them. And then I want to briefly talk about Kratom. Kratom is not appropriate for withdrawal and should not be recommended. And then one other thing to consider is fentanyl test strips. I'm going to talk briefly about both of those. So Kratom. So Kratom is legal to buy in most states. There's a place down the street that, that is, a, is a Kava Kava bar that also does Kratom. I have patients coming in. The very first patient we saw in our clinic was actually not addicted to fentanyl. They were addicted to Kratom. So um, there's this belief that it's safe because it's natural. It's made in tea. Um, it, it acts on the mu opioid receptors. Um, and so people in, in the U.S. are using it for chronic pain and then also opioid withdrawal, right? We had this overprescribing of opioids and then we abruptly like took them away over several years and we left a lot of patients out in the cold and they didn't know what to do. So they started using things like Kratom. So um, there's um, mitrogynine, mitrogynine, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, um, is the dominant species, is the dominant drug in there and it acts as a stimulant. Then it metabolized to 7-hydroxymitrogynine and that has the sedating effects acting like an opioid. So that low doses, it's actually stimulatory. It affects serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, gives people a little bit of high. Once you start getting these high doses, and this is what you'll see, opi cure tablets, they make it into a tea. It starts acting um, on the opioid receptors um, and can counteract some opioid withdrawal. So you'll have patients be like, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm using it for pain. I'm using it to help me get off opioids. That is not appropriate. Look at all these drug interactions. First of all, inhibits CYP3A4, 2D6, 1A2. I have had patients go into psychosis on this. So we had three patients who back to back and we had to end up giving them like Thorazine to kind of calm them down. I mean, we had to, they had to be intubated. They were wild. They were pulling out their tubes. I mean, and, and it was because of this Kratom and you won't see that in the drug literature, but I saw that firsthand. And when they woke up, they were perfectly pleasant. And they said, oh, I was using Kratom. And we were like, don't do that again. Um, and so, um, and so it can have all these withdrawal symptoms from Kratom, the same as you would with opioids, right? Muscle pains, irritable, chills, all of these kind of things. So please don't encourage your patients to use Kratom. If patients are asking you about it, I had, I used to share an office with our um, liver clinic specialist who did uh, liver uh, transplants. And one of her patients was like, hey, I'm using Kratom. And she goes, should they be using that? And I was like, Abs absolutely not. All these drug interactions down there with their new liver. So no, so don't encourage patients to kind of use Kratom. Fentanyl test strips. Love the idea of fentanyl test strips, right? We would normally do them. You would pee on them and they would, and if it's in fentanyls in the urine, it would test positive. You can actually do it where they can take a little bit of their drug, mix it with water and test the fentanyl and, or test it with the test strips and see if it's there. There's been some studies that said patients um, who use fentanyl have modified their drug use behavior. So they made sure there's naloxone nearby. They make sure that there's somebody else that can call if they overdose. They use a little bit less of their drug, right? This is risk mitigation, right? We need to meet people where they are in their, in their journey. Um, there was federal grants have now said you can use some federal grant money to purchase test strips. But in Florida, it's illegal and it's classified as drug paraphernalia. So there is a House bill and a Senate bill right now, 165 and 164, that would remove that. And um, so if anybody's, you know, very involved in, you know, kind of legislation and wants to do this, we I am in full support of this bill. I'm not going to speak on behalf of FSHP. I'm a member, but I'm not speaking on behalf. But I am absolutely for that bill getting passed and removing that because we want to do risk mitigation. I want to give people little baggies that have fentanyl test strips and Narcan kits in them so that when they're ready to get on buprenorphine, they come back to me and we're keeping them safe in the meantime. So I'll get off my soapbox real quick with pregnancy, um, opioid use disorder is a real problem with pregnancy. We're getting a ton of the neonatal absence syndrome in this state has just skyrocketed and it's awful. We wanna give these patients buprenorphine monotherapy. Um, it's thought that the naloxone, um, both of these do cross the, the placental barrier. And so naloxone, when it gets there, can move a little bit faster. It could put the baby into withdrawals. We wanna just use buprenorphine if we can. There's studies saying that the combo product is okay. And so if somebody's on it and gets pregnant, I wouldn't take them off of it. Um, but if you were going to start them, just do the buprenorphine monotherapy. Start them at two to four, increase to 16 milligrams. There can be a lot of metabolism changes, especially in their trimester. We may have to go up on the dose. Um, there's a guidance here. This is a clickable um, that gives you, you know, more guidance from SAMHSA on how to treat these patients. I have a whole bunch of resources. And one thing that I do want to highlight here is pencamp.org. So um, one of my pain colleagues is out. This is um, the University of Pennsylvania's like medicine uh, hospital. For those patients that you have that are going to come in on opioids, but need like ICU or like a med surge level of care um, and who are, who are using fentanyl and you don't know really what to do with them, they 
this has resources on here on how to microdose, so not even two milligrams, but like microgram dosing of buprenorphine, how to initiate it while you're giving them full opioid agonist because they're having, you know, really severe pain and kind of how to taper and titrate and do all that. It's a really great resource. They have a whole bunch of stuff of, you know, hey, Michelle, I'm I'm on the floor and I need to help patients with this and I don't know what to do. They're chewing through Dilaudid. Well, here's how to kind of do that. So it's a really great resource that they came up with because the fentanyl epidemic has been so crazy there. Um, post-test questions. Oh, I'm actually doing okay on time. Oh, I know I was starting, I was going really fast. I want to make sure that I didn't just like blow out all of Kathy's time and there's time for questions. So with the removal of the X waiver, we will likely to see, um, a more buprenorphine prescribing B increase in deaths due to opioid addiction or C more hospitals engaging in the free naloxone dispensing process. So everyone's like thinking about it. I don't know if it's going to highlight. No, it won't. Um, so the answer here is A, more buprenorphine prescribing, right? We've removed one of the barriers to that. Um, so pose this question. So initiation of buprenorphine should begin when a patient's score is A11, B5, C8, or D20. So everyone's thinking about an answer here. Maybe you're going back and you're going, what did Michelle say? Um, so the answer here is we're going to want them to be in at least kind of an upper mild withdrawal. And so that's going to be C. The answer is going to be is going to be eight. And then what is I know I've harped on this like 100 times, so everybody already knows the answer to this one. But what's the minimum effect of buprenorphine daily dose to reduce craving and prevent relapse? So four, eight, 16 or 24. And so I feel like I don't even have to tell you the answer we know is 16 because Michelle screamed it at you, you know, six times in the last 34 minutes. And then, um, and then here, this is the last frame that I'll hand it over to Kathy because I do want to leave time for questions that anybody may have at the end. So when a patient begins MAT therapy, um, ancillary, ancillary medication should not include benzos, haloperidol, clonidine, or on dancitron. I'll take a sip of water to give everybody time to think. And so the answer here is A, benzodiazepines, um, because a lot of patients are gonna crave them and want them. And then that comes with a whole host of problems of you know, seizures and all sorts of stuff. For anxiety, you know, haloperidol is great for both nausea and vomiting and for anxiety, clonidine for anxiety, ondansetron if they're having um, you know, nausea and vomiting, all of those B, um, oh, they should be B, C, and D are all fine. Benzos are what we kind of want to avoid. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Kathy about the free naloxone process um, update because, like I said, everybody's getting naloxone along with their buprenorphine. So how do you how do you do that? So Kathy, take it away. Thanks, Michelle. So I'm going to have you punt it up to me up in North Florida, and then we'll punt it back to you for some discussion. So welcome again, everyone. And I looked and I see I have some out of state friends. I'd like to recognize Ann Polakowski, who is from ASHP, joining us tonight. And I started to think after we had a call the other day, how did we get involved with this free grant naloxone process? Um, and it dawned on me, the Florida Hospital Association, who we had collaborated with in the past, called me and they said, we've got this grant money, we've got naloxone, and we need your help to get it into the hospitals. So it was during the pandemic, we did the best that we could, and um, I'll give you a little bit of an update on that. Michelle, are you still uh, forwarding for me? Thank you. So this is a process by which you will be successful. We were successful in my hospital. We are up and coming with it now. And the very first thing that I would recommend to everyone is to identify champions to bring this forward. So the next slide, Michelle, is uh, a picture of my friend, Callie Perry, who's a nurse practitioner. So I realized as an ICU pharmacist at Baptist Medical Center in Jacksonville South, I was not going to be able to impact this. And it didn't bother me because I know that I'm a central healthcare provider, whether I lead this or support this. So I was able to turf this by identifying Callie and Callie identifying me and wanting to get involved in this. So Callie is a critical care ICU nurse practitioner getting her doctorate. 
And she decided to make this her doctorate um, project. So Callie took this like no one could have taken it. I could never have taken on the challenge that she did and ran with it. So I interviewed her and this is her process. So she became the leadership and she became the key stakeholder. And she immediately began to identify every person and group of persons she would need to interact with, including the physician chiefs of staff. So she made it a point to meet and attend all of their meetings at all of the four or five campuses that we have. She also engaged administration. I'm a little uh, egocentric here to my nursing friends on the call. I put pharmacy here. Of course, nursing is paramount and then informatics as well. Um, if you could move me, Michelle, that'd be great. Please, I beg you, do not forget our mothers and babies. Next slide, please. Callie talked about, do we pilot this? Do we go to one freestanding ED? Do we involve the freestanding EDs? Do we just throw it out there at the wall and see what sticks? So Callie and the group decided that it would be best to roll it out at all the campuses in all the different departments. Now I have Lori Reeves on here who worked for the Department of Health and now works at USF. And this is her slide. I said, Lori, how do I present this slide? And this is what she told me. Mortality rate among new mothers is highest the leading cause, and when I say leading cause, drug-related deaths are the leading cause, and more than 75% of these mothers die after discharge from delivery. It exceeds, and you can see the orange line there, motor vehicle accidents, suicide, homicide, and other causes of death. Now, if you also consider hypertension, hemorrhage, dissection, and you combine those with motor vehicle accident, suicide, and homicide, drug-related deaths due to illicit drugs are the number one cause of mortality in Florida. And in my city of Jacksonville, we are number one in the state. So it is paramount, my Florida and nationwide friends, that we consider mothers and babies when we roll out the free naloxone grant program. Lori, I hope I made you proud. Michelle, if you'll go ahead and do that. Number two, present the project to risk and to the hospital attorney. Get sign off from the hospital attorney. Michelle? So these are the statues to consider. The legislators in Florida have made it very easy to participate in this free grant problem. And I saw that uh, Gordon Garland had mentioned his hospital is doing it. And I'll share some stats with you in just a minute. So in section 465, and that's our uh, license, hospitals do not need to have an outpatient pharmacy license to dispense naloxone as long as it is a 48 hour supply. So the standard of care, because the rate of recidivism is very high post-discharge, is to give four Narcan doses or two kits. There's two nasal sprays in each one kit. Now, if the governor said, if we have an emergency, and usually our emergencies, and if we, as we've talked about here, are hurricanes, you can give a three-day supply or six kits. Now, we're not sure about Narcan, the brand going to OTC, uh, how that will impact anything here. I, I don't imagine that it will, but um, you know, it making sure the patient has an ample supply to overcome that carfentanil dose is gonna be very important. And then um, emergency treatment for suspected opioid overdose, section 381. The legislators a couple of years ago said, let's save our people of Florida and let's get the barriers out. And they, that section really takes the barriers out. Michelle, if you'll help me. 
So this person is an angel. Her name is Jennifer Williams. She works at DCF and she is your contact. She manages this program for the entire state of Florida. She is the head of the program. Then these slides will be available to you afterwards and you'll have her contact information there. We're good. So the next thing you wanna do is identify high-risk patients. And this is the definition of high risk that we took from the literature that Jennifer gave us. Some health systems wanna give it to anybody, naloxone, if, if they have a surgery, they get oxycodone. If you gave me naloxone after I had a surgery, I cannot overdose on opiates because I must have an abundance of kappa receptors because I will vomit after one opiate before I could even think about having two, one, two or three more. So our recommendation really is to be prudent with the free naloxone because there is a finite supply. And I'm not saying it's gonna run out in the next three years or five years, but I'm saying be prudent and identify those people who will really benefit from it rather than giving it to someone like me. Thanks, Michelle. Adopt processes. Guess what? We have, go ahead, Michelle. We have, oh, sorry. Before I go into John Armistead, I want to talk a little bit about CMS. So Callie recognized that CMS requires process improvement projects. And so she is taking this naloxone dispensing process and applying it for my Baptist Health Systems CMS Process Improvement Project. And I think you have to have five of these at all time. So dispensing naloxone to patients will be one of our measurable goals for CMS. Now that's a big selling point to administrators. Thanks, Michelle. On our webpage, you will see this. It will flash before you if you're patient enough um, it'll give you five different things. And this one you can click on and where it says click for more is where all of our information is to get you enrolled. And also in a minute, I'll talk about MAT therapy. So a year ago is when we went to the FSHP annual meeting and we talked about getting hospitals involved. So we, excuse me there. Um, thanks Tamika for helping me manage that. So we, in one year, have added 17 hospitals. Now, I'd like to recognize Jeff Bush on this call because Jeff, before he retired from HCA, worked on getting, and I think they're in the process of getting 50 hospitals enrolled uh, in this process. So we currently have 52 hospitals enrolled in the state of Florida and 17 hospitals since FSHP got involved one year ago. I call that success. We're good, Michelle. This is a very important document and it gives you the entire overview of the program, how to set it up. Jennifer is in there, what to do. Uh, the processes, Michelle, if you'll go next with me, are also available under that little tag. And John Armistead gave us all of Lee Health's naloxone, nasal, mother and baby, uh, and pharmacy ED processes. And so DCF has embraced those processes. We have de-identified them and they are free for your health system if you wanna get involved in this. And we ask you to please get involved in this. As Callie Perry says, if one life is saved, it's worth the entire process. We're good, Michelle. There was one requirement, and that is that education must be given and documented for each patient in the medical record. So you must, and, and the, it can be loaded into your Omnicell, your Pixis, and the nurse can go ahead and take it out. It does not need to be labeled, and you can give it to the patient, but she's got to show them how to use it. We have processes on our webpage for how to use it. It's in those Lee Health de-identified processes and you must document. 
that the patient has been shown how to use the kit or a family member has been known has been shown how to use the kit. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, by the way, we also have on our web page live and on demand webinars from ASHP on managing opiates and um, REMS compliant CE for pharmacists if you are interested in that program as well. Thanks, Michelle. And coming back to our web page where it says click for more, if you click on that yellow bar, go ahead, Michelle, you will come to this page. And the last link there is DCF Regional Directors for MAC Clinic Grants. And if you'll click one more time for me, Michelle, on this slide, this is what it looks like. It is a list of contacts for you by county and it's DCF contacts, and they will put you in touch with an administrator in your area, and you can get your MAC clinic set up. Michelle, do you wanna take a moment to talk about how your MAC therapy, well, how your clinic was funded? Yeah, so um, so one thing I forgot to tell you was um, our success rate with doing the combination of um, medication assisted treatment with therapy. So we had um, social workers and peer specialists involved who were doing, you know, the therapy and the group therapy. I did med ed once a week. Um, and so our rate of people reducing or not using opioids was uh, or stimulants was like 70 to 80 percent. Um, it was it's much, much higher than the clinics in the area who were not using um, any kind of medication, you know, treatment at all. Um, so how we were funded is we um, we got a grant from the state of Florida um, that went through. Well, it was kind of a grant. We actually got state appropriated funding. So someone prior to me working there um, had applied. So the first the first one that we got was actually. Um, peer specialists in our ED with the goal of meeting people, meeting patients where they are. So patient people who had been in recovery for at least two years, they go to bedside, they were helping dispense the naloxone kits. We followed um, a similar protocol to Lee's Health, Lee Health's uh, model, um, you know, talking to patients and then getting them, you know, treatment, you know, cause we didn't have anything in house. So they had that initial one. And then we got another one state appropriated funding um, through the state of Florida that we worked with some of these, um, you know, like DCF or whatever, we were licensed through DCF to open up a, an outpatient medication, medication assisted treatment clinic. And so um, um, we worked with um, our managing entity was Broward Behavioral Health Coalition who works in Broward County. Um, so they kind of helped us get everything started, manage the paperwork. There's a lot of reporting that goes, you know, on with it because the state wants to know how are you spending their money. Um, and so, you know, we did monthly reports, quarterly reports or whatever. We have to show, you know, how many patients are we seeing? You know, what are the outcomes that we're, we're doing and, and all of that. And so we did state appropriated funding that was applied for. And so additional funding is coming down and that's on one of our resource, not the, um, the previous resource slide, because there's all this opioid abatement money that's coming down. And so whatever program you're wanting to start, if it's naloxone, please reach out to Jennifer Williams. I, that's who I work with. She's amazing. She can't wait. If you want Narcan, she will get it for you. She wants to help you at your hospital system um, or your outpatient clinic or whatever to, to get that. Um, but, you know, start small. It doesn't have to be a big MAC clinic. You know, it could just be a peer specialist program. The peers were amazing and they, you know, they meet people where they are, they meet them at bedside and then, you know, and then they can, you, they can help you dispense the naloxone that you now have from DCF and Jennifer Williams, you know, and, you know, fentanyl test strips, if you decide to go that route and then continue on with, you know, how do you get patients, you know, we were paying for their, their, their MAT therapy. We were paying for some of those supplemental meds. If somebody needed help, you know, with their diabetes meds, I had gotten additional grant funding from Broward Sheriff's Office who gave, ten, gave us $10,000 to help with that. So there's money out there if you just kind of like look for it and use these um, kind of resources, um, you know, that are there that, that Kathy's talked about on all these slides. Thank you, Michelle. I'm ready to go to the next one. So we have resources here for you. And um, I think this is the duplicate slide. So let's go to the next one. I do wanna mention before we have open discussion that we are having our FSHP annual meeting August 4th through the 6th, registration is open. It is at, oh my goodness, Palms, Gaylord Palms in Orlando. And Tamika's done such a great job with this. 
that our hotel rooms are $164 a night for this five-star resort. And so the comparative prices today are about $400 a room. So come join us at FSHP, come to a couple of things at the meeting and have a Disney vacation. So I think that concludes our presentation, but what I would like to do um, is to go back to you, Michelle, and, and I think Nisha is gonna help us field the questions. All right. Yes, I'm looking in the chat. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle and Kathy for sharing all those resources. I put in the chat that very much this topic is timely. The DEA has put out uh, a notification about watching out for xylosine with a fentanyl, that it's a public safety hazard. So I don't think this topic could be more timely in how we show our value to the multidisciplinary teams yes. and also to our patients where pharmacists and pharmacy technicians stand in the gap of taking care of people. With that, I know it was a lot of information. I completely love the KI slide where Michelle talked yes, about science. Yeah. So go ahead with questions. Everything up. When I come in in the morning, I want to see it clean. Oh, somebody is not on mute. They're in the they're in the room. Charles, can you mute yourself, please? Thank you. Go ahead, Nisha. Does that anybody was a, else have questions? Oh, I don't see all. any in the chat. Um, it, there's a question from Sandy Descala to say, do we have an opioid stewardship group in FSHP? Mm, Nisha, that's for you. <laughs> that's a good question, Sandy. Um, we are looking to partner with FHA, both the critical care group and the med safety group. So we can add it to our brainstorming for charges next year since there's significant work in our systems. Great question. There's also some comments um, from Mike Sanchez. Any news on how the Putnam County Treatment Center was able to use vending machines for their Narcan distribution? It doesn't seem like that method meets the requirements listed. Um, I'm gonna ask a stupid question. I'm not originally from Florida. Is 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 Putnam County in Florida? Because I, I know that Ohio, one of my, I reached out to a colleague there, Ohio started doing vending machines there, but their Ohio Board of Pharmacy actually changed the law for them to allow that. So is Putnam County, is there a Putnam County in Florida? I'm really sorry. No, know. that's fine. But let me, let me take that because we are allowed to have vending machines dispense medication. So who, who's asking the question, what makes you think that it's illegal? Now, we, we went to the legislature and we actually blocked that technology. And then the board came around and regulated it because the board regulates the dispensing process. The legislators don't regulate that. And the board has allowed SpotRx and other technologies. And that is the future of community pharmacy. So, um, Maybe we can dialogue afterwards as to what would make you think that that's illegal. That's currently legal in Florida. You know, Kathy, if I had to say, if I had to make a guess, because this was my question too, was the labeling requirement. Now that's going to go away with naloxone be going over OTC, but that was always my question with the naloxone was the labeling requirement because it's still a prescription drug and the Florida legislature, you know, it says any prescription drug has to be labeled with a patient's name, et cetera. So I but think- But not, 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 not naloxone. And the reason is it's under that 388 chapter. Okay. Now, if a pharmacist dispenses it and it's a prescription drug, it requires patient-specific labeling. So if a nurse practitioner, PA, physician dispenses it, it does not. So education, and this is my boss, Jeff, you can say hello to Jeff to everyone and vice versa. Education, now the way that these technology machines work is that there's a pharmacist approving orders. So the, pharma, the patient comes up and there's still counseling going on. So the pharmacist talks to the patient through the machine and can dispense it from the machine and then say to the patient, I'm, my picture's here, I'm gonna open up this nasal spray. I'm going to demonstrate use with my placebo. And then I want you to be able to demonstrate use with your medication. And then that needs to be documented. So I think maybe this, the concept of SpotRx is something we can look to talk about 
it does not remove a pharmacist from the dispensing medic. Uh, so the pharmacist would do the education. Oh, Dr. thank Kathy, you. I'll, and I'll add to that to say like maybe that is about the labeling of requirement when it's dispensed from your ERs. Um, like even if it's a provider dispensing it, what that labeling requirement is, I think there's something in the pharmacy chapter. Yeah, no, it's in 388 where it says you don't have to label it. Okay. And there's, um, a for, for there's a couple more questions. There's a couple more questions. Jeff Siebert asks, compare and contrast use of buprenorphine versus buprenorphine with Narcan in the inpatient setting. So here's the good news. Um, okay, so let, let's go back to the KI and the oral bioavailability. So naloxone oral bioavailability is, is next to none, right? That's why we have to do it as a nasal spray or inject people. Um, and buprenorphine has also very poor bioavailability. So the thing is, is that really there, it shouldn't make a difference, right? If you give them buprenorphine or buprenorphine naloxone, right? Because even if they were to misuse it, let's say, right? They were somehow able to get their tab or get their film and crush it up and inject it. Like we said, naloxone's half-life is 30, 30 to, to 90 minutes, right? Buprenorphine is 28, you know, 28 hours. And so um, the naloxone will come in, it might bind, kick off any opioids they have, but then the buprenorphine will come on there. Anecdotally, and I tried to find some data to support this, I'm not, but I saw full disclosures anecdotal. I think in general, patients have this idea that the buprenorphine naloxone like will kind of keep them on the straight and narrow in a way that buprenorphine won't, right? So it's just the idea that the naloxone is in there. So my thing is like, if it's a cost, it go with whatever's cheaper, right? So like my hospital, my hospital did not, we didn't carry the films. We only did the sublingual tablets. So this is what we did. So there's not really a difference. I would say that if anybody's having any liver dysfunction, if they are pregnant, or if they have some kind of intolerance to naloxone, then use the monotherapy. You always wanna use it for those three patients. Otherwise give the combo therapy, just because it seems to kind of have a psychological effect on the patients um, in that they're more likely to kind of like stay the course and do better. They're less likely, I think in general, to try and sell it if they were to get it. That's not really inpatient. It's more of like if you give them a prescription for it on the way out. Um, so I don't know with comparing and contrasting what else you kind of want me to say. They're, they're very similar, you know, products in the naloxone should really in theory be doing nothing. So then it wouldn't, you know, really, you know, matter because the dosing is the same as well. So on our collaborative calls with DCF and Department of Health, we worked with a Blue Cross Blue Shield pharmacist who brought the costs of the different products of buprenorphine forward and buprenorphine, we were shocked to see how cheap it was, mm -hmm. plain buprenorphine. And compared to methadone, compared to all the other products, it was pennies. Yeah. And so it's their preferred product at Blue Cross Blue Shield. Yeah. That's a really good piece of information because the next question, I know it's 702. So for those of you who need to drop off, completely understand. But if you have a couple more minutes, I'd like to take the next two questions. Um, there was a question about, um, should we be concerned about the cost for our patients now that Narcan is going OTC connected to? So I, our, our Narcan program was completely through um, the state of, was through the state of Florida through DCF. So Jennifer Williams is at Department of Children and Family Services. We got ours for free. So we didn't pay for it, right? So they they have a program and, and they do that and they're, you know, because of all this opioid abatement money, they have this ongoing for at least the next couple of years. So from that perspective, no, because we never paid for it. And we we had to quarantine it in your in your pharmacy, right? Because it's not part of your um, you know, your your medications. Um, so we just kept it in a separate, you know, kind of area, and that was our Narcan area. But I wouldn't kind of anticipate that because it's not going generic, it's just going OTC. And so I think that's going to help with other states and the labeling requirement and, you know, getting, you know, rid of any confusion there. So I wouldn't anticipate it. Got it. And there was also uh, one more question about, uh, is there a path to Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholic Anonymous in your clinic model? Um, in ours, no. And I'm going, to try, I'm going to try to say this in the right way. It was always something that if somebody was interested, it was offered to them. But the AANA model is not for everybody because it 
it, it takes a very um, Christian approach, right? So I'm, I'm not going to get into religion or that's not the point of this call. That's not for everybody. And I think if you don't subscribe to there's a higher power or whatever, and it does tend to focus on, um, you know, abstinence only model. So my social workers who were very, very good um, and had been working in substance use disorder for the last 10 years, they didn't push that model because they're the evidence isn't there in the way that it's there for cognitive behavioral therapy for the for you know group therapy you know nine or 12 hours a week in all those cases would we ever discourage somebody no and we encourage people to go to groups right but it doesn't have to be the na na you know aa na model it could be any kind of substance use disorder group that they were working with if that makes sense thank you for that um and i think most of the other comments are excellent work. Um, somebody did mention Sarah Lynn Tuttle, uh, that she mentioned treating NAS babies. That's on required almost two months to wean because uh, the mom was exposed, the baby was exposed to kratom in utero, that, you know, this is a significant hazard. And everybody really enjoyed the presentation. And several people did say they're going to start promoting this at their sites. Woo! Um, I've got you all on my soapbox now. That's all I want. I just want to convert you all to love buprenorphine as much as I do. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Nisha. I should have introduced you. This is the wonderful Nisha Matthew, um, who's been my right hand and in, in working with medication safety and doing a lot with uh, the Florida Hospital Association. So thank you, Nisha. Thank you for having me. I think it's a timely topic where you know, we have an army of pharmacists and technicians who've battled the pandemic and been of service. And this is the next one where we make lemonade out of these lemons. So <laughs> I'm learning from Kathy hey. and the amazing work that, you know, the pharmacists are doing to set these up and connect the resources because we have an opportunity in our EDs. We have an opportunity in our clinics. We have an opportunity in our hospitals and the paperwork is taxing, but we can be of service. Thank you, Nisha. All right, Michelle, I, I think that we'll call it a night and the, the slides will be, uh, Tamika, if you're on, or will they be posted or emailed? Either way, Rebecca, we'll make sure that you get them. Thank you for that question. Where will they be? Um, I think they're coming out in your email. So we'll, we'll ensure that everyone gets them. So thank you all very much for your time. We're very grateful that you chose to join us. Good don't night. Don't forget to do the evaluation. That is in the yes. chat. And also it's coming, coming to your to an email near you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Michelle. Bye. Thanks.